So my lab uh, looks at a number of different things. Let's see if I've got a pointer here. Related to hu human hematopoiesis, um, we've been studying this field for about 20 years or so, and we're very interested in lymphoid commitment in pluripotent stem cells. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is our work in the thymus, um, which dovetails into our interest in, in immune reconstitution. And all of this comes from, from my interest as a bone marrow transplant physician um, in Hemonc. So this is um, what I've called my talk, and really I'm going to be covering very briefly because of the limited amount of time that we have, um, the different aspects of this question of the thymus um, that we, the, the, the lab is studying, its role in development and aging, uh, reconstitution after transplantation, some work that we're doing on the microenvironment, particularly about VEGF, and on thymic engineering. So it's a lot to cover in 10 minutes, so I apologize if it'll be a bit schizophrenic. So uh, aging of the thymus is a very interesting um, question that, we, that we're addressing. So as you probably know, the normal production of T cells absolutely requires a healthy thymic microenvironment. Um, and the key cells within the thy thymic microenvironment are these thymic epithelial cells, or TECs, and I'm going to refer to them over and over during the talk. After infancy, the thymus begins to shrink. So as an organ, it's very, very early onset um, of what we call involution or aging. And it gets progressively replaced with fat. And that can be further damaged by insults in addition to aging, anything like infections, HIV is a particular one, chemotherapy, radiation, and transplantation itself. So the child or the infant has the largest thymus. And from, from about 12 months old, it starts to regress so that you get this nice cellular pattern in infancy, and even by very early um, adulthood, you get replacement with fat. That's shown again here, so you can see this sort of progression, so that when you're in your late middle ages, um, you're, it's mostly fat that you're running on with very little of this thymic epithelium. And what that means is that if you've got a bad thymic microenvironment, you get immune dysregulation and relative immune um, deficiency. And this is thought to be one of the reasons that in aging, there's an increased risk of infections, cancer, and autoimmune disease. So we came into this field of, thym of the thymus because we were using transplantation models. In particular, we were using a neonatal bone marrow transplant model um, to study our hematopoietic cells. And what we found um, in, sort of in summary from a number of studies was that whether we used human cells into an immunodeficient mouse or allogeneic mouse cells, whatever essentially you transplant, um, the neonatal thymus could be rapidly engrafted by the donor bone marrow, even without giving any of our usual conditioning therapy like radiation. And that um, in the adult, on the other hand, which is the classic transplant model, you require some form of conditioning, let's say radiation, to get marrow engraftment and then thymus engraftment. So the neonate was happening fast and, and without the need for radiation. And this is in a mouse model. Um, and that also made us realize that actually clinically, there's a lot to suggest that there may be some corollaries in, in uh, humans, in that when you look at the SCID patients, the severe combined in, immune deficiency patients that are transplanted very, very early on um, in life, they can also in fact reconstitute uh, their T cells without any conditioning. And they're usually done within the um, infancy. And there's a, a trial uh, that, or a studies that have been done showing that neonates fare much better than adults. So this has led us to ask what's the mechanism by which rapid reconstitution occurs. And this is just to remind us that the thymic microenvironment really sort of instructs the development of T cells. They come in at this junction of the cortex and the medulla. You can see the cortex is this dense area here in the medulla is, is, uh, has less cells in it. And then they migrate through the cortex and they undergo um, positive selection and then they get back into the medulla with negative selection. So there's a lot of migration happening. And this is all being orchestrated by these, these uh, epithelial cells. So, this is what people have mostly studied in the thymus. The hematopoietic cells that go in and, and reside there and differentiate, which make up over 95% of the entire organ. So when you look at a thymus, that's essentially what you see, unless you look a little harder. And then the other component, component that's led to most of the studies are these thymic epithelial cells, which are critical. 
But our lab's been interested also in the mesenchyme within this organ and the thymic vasculature, because obviously um, it's likely that they're all playing a part within the, the system. So some years ago, we started looking at, at the endothelium, at the vasculature, reasoning that if engraftment was happening so fast without radiation, maybe the vasculature was different. And what we noticed was that in the neonatal thymus, this is um, sort of lectin staining that you, you uh, inject in vivo, you can see this incredibly dense capillary ne network, very highly branched, whereas the adult has more of a classic sort of hierarchical structure. And this really reminded us of tumours. And we looked into the literature and found that actually there are other organs, not all, in, as neonates, have this sort of vasculature, and it's driven by VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. These are some studies now that were published a while ago. And what, that's, what they show is that if we block VEGF very early on in life, we get this drop of vascular density. But if you block it later on, it has no effect. So it's just telling you that it's in this first seven days of a mouse's life that it has VEGF-dependent vasculature. That's the same period in which you can get this tremendous engraftment of the thymus. So this sort of links the two, and we've gone on and, and blocked VEGF during transplantation and showed that it stops that rapid reconstitution. So this is just to summarize those studies. Uh, VEGF, if you inhibit it, blocks angiogenesis. I didn't show you, but it reduces thymocyte numbers and it blocks early reconstitution. But it doesn't alter marrow reconstitution and it doesn't change the adult. So we are now asking what, what other mechanisms could it work with. And to do this, uh, Batul Sudawala in the lab, who's now who's shortly uh, to go on into a faculty position at Loma Linda, has been working on a way to sort of fractionate up all of these rare subpopulations within the thymus, looking at um, not just epithelial cells we see here, and CTEX and MTEX, but also endothelial cells and mesenchyme, and finding that there are two populations at least of those. And what she's found is that you can now quantitate what's happening. Um, you can see the adult has mostly MTEX, these light colours, and the neonate is mostly CTEX, and you can actually quantitate that change, this ratio, using this flow cytometry. You can sort the cells out and you can do gene expression. Um, and if you inhibit these um, neonates, you find that the same change that occurs from the neonate to the adult happens with VEGF blockade. So we think that VEGF is one contributor to this sort of maturation, or at least it's supporting um, primitiveness. We've gone on recently to do RNA-seq from these populations, and we're now looking at fetal, neonate, and adult. And, and as expected, the neonate is just the sort of the end point of the fetus, although it has some specific, unique characteristics of its own, and it's great to manipulate. So we've got some really nice data, and this is from digesting tissue. It's about an eight-hour process to get to, to the RNA, and yet it's, it's working pretty well. So just to finish off, this is some work done by Brow Chung originally, and now um, Amelie Montalhagen and Kenneth Kim. And this is to ask the question, can we, if we put VEGF back into a system, does it help reconstitution? So to do this, Amelie um, has developed these cultures where you can take thymus, and you take little fragments of the thymus and grow them in specific conditions, mesenchymal conditions or epithelium. And over about three weeks, you get this really nice monolayer, which is, has been very difficult to establish in the past. And you can see that gene expression is what it should be with each of these populations. Then what she can do is take these human thymus samples grow the tex, expand the tex and the mesenchyme out, and actually manipulate them ex vivo with a lentiviral vector, and then centrifuge them all together to make a three-dimensional aggregate with some hematopoietic cells. And we mark them with HLA disparity so that we can tell what's coming from what. Those, cells can, those aggregates can then be put in a dish or put into an immune deficient mouse and grown out. So now we can ask with VEGF or whatever else whether it um, it, it affects things. And the short answer is VEGF makes it better. Um, you get bigger thymuses, you get more thymocytes, you get great endothelial staining. If you can see that, that's an endothelial marker. So it's getting revascularized, lots of epithelium. And this is difficult to see, but this is a notch ligand key for T cells, delta like ligand 4, which is much better in the VEGF. And you get all different populations growing better in this. This may just be because it revascularizes better. 
So this is the future directions of the lab in developmental biology. We're, we want to move this transcriptome profile into the human, um, test the novel ligands that we've discovered um, in our transcriptome analysis so far. We are looking at using these implants to induce tolerance with a group here. And we are also interested in clinically scaling up these implants in collaboration with Ben Wu to develop scaffolds. And potentially our first clinical target would be de George syndrome or thymic aplasia. So thank you. Basically, that's what we're aiming for. <laughs> thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Brain tumors are the second most common type of cancer we see in children. There are about 4,500 new cases per year in the United States. And unlike the most common type of cancer in children, leukemia, where we've seen great improvements in treatment over the last four decades, we haven't had as many successes in pediatric brain tumors, and they continue to be in ch a challenge to treat. In fact, they're the leading cause of cancer morbidity and mortality in childhood. And what is more striking is that after accidents, homicides, and suicides, uh, pediatric brain tumors are the most common cause of death in children between the ages of 1 and 16 in North America and Western Europe. Uh, of all the types of pediatric brain tumors, high-grade gliomas are a, one of the most challenging groups to treat, and they're also the focus of my research. These tumors are uh, malignant tumors that arise from either glial cells, ependymal cells, or oligodendrocytes. They're, by definition, World Health Organization grade 3 or grade 4 tumors, and the most common histologies are anaplastic astrocytoma and glioblastoma multiforme. They are characterized by hypercellularity, nuclear atypia, and high mitotic activity with or without microvascular proliferation and pseudopalisading necrosis. They make up about 8 to 12 percent of all pediatric brain tumors. There is no true consensus of the standard of care treatment for these tumors, but usually radiation therapy, maximal surgery, and chemotherapy are combined. Even with all of these forms of therapy, outcome is dismal, with overall survival ranging from less to, than 10% to 30%. Clearly, more effective therapies are desperately needed. There have been a number of sequential prospective national clinical trials run in the United States over the last three decades, looking at the combinations of different chemotherapeutic regimens and radiation therapy in this disease. Because of the short time, let me just summarize, but um, what we have been able to find is that chemo plus radiation improves event-free survival when compared to radiation alone, but when looking at different chemotherapeutic regimens, there has been no significant progress. The most recent uh, national trial that was published was CNS0126, looking at radiation therapy and temozolomide. This was following the same protocol as the STOOP protocol used in adults. That actually was the first time we saw improved outcome in adults with GBMs. In pediatrics, we saw a three-year event-free survival of 11%, which was not significantly different than any of the other chemotherapy regimens. But we did see less toxicity with this therapy, and because of that, this is a good backbone to, um, to add upon in future trials. Here at UCLA, we've been at the forefront of looking at immunotherapy as a treatment for brain tumors. The reason this is an appealing form of therapy is that there's a potential for a high degree of tumor specificity while sparing the healthy brain tissue that surrounds the tumors. Under, ship, under the leadership of Linda Lau, Dr. Linda Lau and Dr. Robert Prinz, we've specifically been looking here at dendritic cells. The roles of these cells are to alert the, bo to the body, the immune system in the body, when there are foreign antigens present. These are the most potent antigen-presenting cells, and when they, become, when they are presented with foreign antigens, they become activated, they take up, process, and present foreign antigens on their cell surface. They then migrate to secondary lymphoid structures, such as lymph nodes, and present the foreign antigens to T cells, inducing an immune response. The thought is, if you can present the tumor antigens to these dendritic cells, they could take them up, process them, and then present them to the T cells to then go and migrate and attack any residual tumor cells that remain in the brain. 
This is why they have the potential for being a tumor vaccine. These are pictures from Dr. Robert Prin's lab just showing um, dendritic cells actually in the process of consuming a GBM cell. The green is a state, uh, fluorescence of the GBM cell. So there have been two phase one studies here at UCLA, UCLA looking at dendritic cell vaccines in adult GBMs, and there is an ongoing phase two trial currently in adults. Each of these trials have followed a similar schematic. Patients arrive with a tumor. Uh, they undergo surgery uh, with the goal to maximally resect it. After the surgery, majority of the tumor is, um, is digested into a single cell suspension and then prepared into a tumor lysate, which is frozen for later use. During recovery of surgery, the patients undergo leukapheresis to um, obtain monocytes. These monocytes are then enriched with interleukin-4 and GMCSF to differentiate into dendritic cells. The patients then undergo radiation and chemotherapy, after which the cultured dendritic cells are, are pulsed with the tumor lysate, packaged in vaccine form, and administered intradermally to the patients. Hypothetically, these dendritic cells will then go to their lymph nodes and recruit the T cells to attack any residual T cells. There have been a number of publications um, showing the results of these trials. Toxicity in the two phase one trials have been minimal with no grade three or four adverse um, events. These studies have not been powered for overall survival, but there has been a trend um, that clearly shows there may be um, a benefit of having the vaccine therapy in addition to radiation and chemotherapy. Here in this table, I show the results of the 22 patients treated with the DC vaccine in the phase one study, and I compare it to the STUP protocol adult study, which had the best outcomes so far that have been published. And you can see over the five-year points, there seems to be a trend that the patients who get vaccine are having better survival. Because of these promising findings, a feasibility pilot in pediatrics was initiated in 2007 by Dr. Ted Moore and Dr. Joe Lasky. Seven patients were enrolled at that time. Five of them had multiply recurrent disease, while two patients had primary disease of high-grade gliomas. Of the seven patients, only three patients actually were able to receive the DC vaccines. The other patients either progressed before obtaining the vaccine, and one patient dropped out. Um, all nine vaccine doses were tolerated well with very minimal toxicity. What we did find was a feasibility issue in patients with recurrent disease. Because of the delay from surgery to time of vaccine production, three of those patients did progress prior to getting the vaccine. Because of this, future studies will be focused on patients with newly diagnosed high-grade gliomas. There were three patients who received vaccine, two of which are still alive. Here's an example of a 13-year-old girl with a GBM who's, who has no evidence of disease now more than five years from vaccine. This leads us to my current study, which is a non-randomized, open-label, multi-center phase two study evaluating the efficacy and safety of DC vaccination in pediatric patients with newly diagnosed high-grade gliomas. I'll be running this trial through the Pacific Pediatric Neuro-Oncology Consortium, which is a new consortium focused on looking at targeted therapy for kids with brain tumors. Going through this consortium will allow, allow us to reach more patients and have 11, participate, par, 11 institutions participate in the study. We'll also be working with Northwest Biotherapeutics to centrally produce the vaccines so that we can distribute them to all the different centers. I'm the study chair, and Dr. Linda Lau will be the co-chair. The primary objective of the study is to evaluate the safety of DC Vax in these pediatric patients with newly, newly diagnosed high-grade gliomas when given with temozolomide after surgery and radiation. We will also be comparing the one-year progression-free survival between pediatric patients on this trial with the historical one-year progression-free survival from ACNS0126. The backbone of our trial is identical to ACNS0126 with just the addition of the vaccines. We'll be also, secondary objectives will be to evaluate the overall survival. The schematics are similar to the adult trials. All patients will undergo surgery, then they will um, receive temozolomide plus radiation therapy, after which they will get three doses of dendritic cell vaccine and then move on to maintenance with temozolomide. 
If they have enough vaccine material remaining, they will get vaccine boosters every two months until the material is insufficient. We also have a number of correlative biological objectives in this study that we will um, luckily be able to obtain peripheral blood from the patients and have it all sent to UCLA as well as tumor tissue. And work, we'll be working with Dr. Robert Prince to have um, these studies performed. We'll be, uh, the first objective is to identify immunologic response biomarkers for dendritic cell vaccinations. We hope we'll be able to find a surrogate, a surrogate marker in the peripheral blood that will um, let us understand which patients will have better outcomes with these vaccines. We'll be running multi-parametric flow cytometry on the peripheral blood lymphocytes and look at the different lymphocytes as well as activation and negative co-stimulatory markers, both before vaccines and after vaccines. We will also be quantifying the estimated T cell receptor content and assess the T cell receptor clonality within the tumor itself. We'll be, in order to accomplish this, we will sequence the TCR beta chain variable regions from the actual tumor tissue and correlate this with clinical outcome. We hypothesize that clinical responses to the vaccine will be associated with increased TCR clonality, which may represent tumor-specific T-cell expansion within the tumor, as well as in the peripheral blood. Finally, we'll also want to determine, because we have this tissue available, we would like to see if we can um, separate the tumors by gene expression profiling and find distinct bio, um, dist groups that have distinct biological properties that may be more responsive to DC vaccine immunotherapy. To accomplish this, we'll be doing RNA-seq, and this will be performed on pretreatment tumor samples. We will then run unsupervised hierarchical clustering to identify genes that segregate survival groups in an unbiased fashion. I'd like to acknowledge the UCLA Brain Tumor Research Group, specifically my mentors, Dr. Prinz and Dr. Lau, uh, my colleagues at PNOC, I would like to um, thank the Department of Pediatrics, especially uh, one of my fellows, Mel Melody Sue, who is in Dr. Prince's lab and is working on the correlative aims, as well as Dr. Moore and Dr. Lasky, who started the pediatric part of this study. And I'd like to thank my funding sources, Miles for Hope Foundation, Today's and Tomorrow's Children Fund, and Joseph Drown Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for uh, having the opportunity to present my uh, health services research. Um, so I wanted to give an overview about pediatric cancer survivorship. So we know that pediatric adolescent and young adult survivors of childhood cancer are at high risk for premature morbidity and mortality due to cancer treatment at a young age. And as a result, they require a lifelong follow-up, one, for targeted surveillance for late effects detection, and two, to have risk reduction counseling to try to prevent the late effects for which they're at risk for. This uh, slide shows um, the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, which I'll give a little bit more detail to, but really has established the field of childhood cancer survivorship. And in this large study by Dr. By, done by Dr. Mertens, um, it has shown that compared to US uh, population norms for the same age, childhood cancer survivors have much higher uh, much lower rates of survival probability as they age from five years from diagnosis all the way out to 30 years that this study uh, cohort is able to follow. The main reasons for their causes of mortality are cancer, secondary cancers, and then cardiovascular and pulmonary disease. When we look at the type of care that the childhood cancer survivors are done, uh, Dr. Nathan at uh, Sick Kids in Toronto did a study also through, childhood through the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study and showed that when you're following them into adulthood, the majority actually are accessing the medical care system. So 90% in this cohort will get into medical care. But when you're looking at is any of that care focused on their prior cancer history, which we uh, is titled survivor focused care, it drops to about a third. And then when they actually get specific risk reduction counseling or ordering a screening to detect these late effects, it's really less than 20% that are getting the care they need, although they're at a much higher risk for uh, for death due to these secondary late effects. So um, the work that I've been doing 
with the group, I wanted to highlight uh, three studies, the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study and some of the work that I've done with this group. Second one, through our Live Strong Centers of Excellence Network, um, where we did a survey of young adult survivors. And third, um, a study that we're doing here, which is a community collaborative uh, research study, which is a P20 funded, um, that was a feasibility study for collaborating with a minority serving institution, which is a nonprofit, and an NCI designated cancer center, which is uh, what we are at UCLA, to establish a collaborative partnership to do survivorship research in the community setting. So the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, I wanted to put this up for any junior investigators or anyone interested, but um, it's a U-funded mechanism, and it's to promote and facilitate research among long-term survivors. So all of the cancer patients were diagnosed before age 21. It's 26 institutions. UCLA is a participating site. Um, currently, the data that's available is for those that were treated with the earlier cohorts, and based on what we found through CCSS studies, we actually have changed our regimens trying to decrease these late effects, but for um, currently the data is for those diagnosed between 1970 and 1986 um, and have survived five or more years. And actually, anybody who's available, it's, a, it's something that we encourage junior investigators to use. So the first study that I wanted to talk about is um, my interest on the impact that insurance type would have on the survivor-focused care in, and also for general preventative care. Um, I did this on what we call the baseline survey, the initial survey that was done, and we survey patient, our survivor cohort every two years. I'm just highlighting some of the um, important findings that we found, and we hypothesized that if you had privately insured, if you were a privately insured survivor, you would have the best care. Um, not surprisingly, we found that if you had no insurance, you had a much lower odds of reporting any type of survivor-focused care. So we said, was any of the visit related to a can cancer-related visit, so you could be at your primary care doctor's office, but still getting cancer-related care, or we also were very, if, if you got back to your cancer center, then we hypothesized there probably was some cancer-related care. So if you were uninsured, you had lower odds of getting this type of care. And then for other general preventive care, which the survivors also need for screening for these late effects, um, they were also less likely to have a general physical exam or dental exam. And we also focused on some cancer screening processes for females and uh, they also had lower odds. What was interesting though, in the publicly insured group, which, um, which was very interesting to us, we actually found that they had a higher odds of reporting both the survivor-focused care as well as the general preventive care compared to the private, um, privately insured. And we hypothesized that possibly if you get into a healthcare system through the publicly insured um, plan, it's been written about that um, having cancer is, um, is a teachable moment, so you may be more likely to listen to the providers about the screening, or they may be more likely to be able to get that done. We then wanted to look like what is happening longitudinally with the same cohort. And so we were looking at the longitudinal changes over time, and then what could predict increased or decreased um, rates of the survivor-focused care. Um, and just for purposes of time, three mutually exclusive categories, no care, general medical care, or the survivor-focused care that focused on the late effects screening. And again, um, what we found were some interesting findings that the very people that need it the most, because these are the ones that have the risk for late effects, had a much higher odds of reporting a decrease in the survivor-focused care. So over time, they were less likely to get the care that they need and males were at increased risk, and again, insurance was another important predictor variable. If you didn't have insurance, you, you had a higher rate of not getting that care. Um, so we think that there has to be some type of structured transition planning visits in still in the pediatric healthcare setting to get them to know about these risk for late effects when they go into the adult healthcare system. Then we went on to the Livestrong Centers of Excellence, where there's eight centers, and this cohort um, is to examine effectiveness of survivorship care through research, development of new interventions, and sharing of best practices. And we surveyed 376 young adult survivors and talked to them, uh, asked them about their, the type of care that they had and how confident they were in receiving the care that they needed. And what we found is, if you were a minority survivor, 
you were less, you, you had higher odds of being less confident of knowing how to navigate your care as an adult. So not having that patient empowerment to know what care you needed. And then there's also something advocated of a survivorship care plan that the Institute of Medicine said should be a part of standard um, documentation. And if you got if you did not get this survivorship care plan, um, you had a much higher odds of reporting low confidence. So we said that um, these survivorship care plans seem to better prepare our patients for being a self-assured to uh, navigate the healthcare system as they age, and that we had to do something different for our minority populations um, who had less confidence of knowing how to navigate the healthcare system as survivors. So that brought us to our third study, where we partnered with Padres Contra el Cancer, or Parents Against Cancer, which is a nonprofit group that uh, supports Latino families affected by pediatric or adolescent or young adult cancers that was started 20 years ago in Los Angeles and now serves many states. And we had, when we applied for this grant, we um, had already a longstanding um, history of working together. We had done a study together trying to understand qualitatively what could be different for Latinos in terms of navigating care and basically, oops. Well, now what did I do? Um, and what we found was it was still very important to include the, uh, the family and survivorship care discussions. Um, and, uh, and this is not the typical model in the adult healthcare setting. It was, there was a lot of cancer stigma about bringing up cancer care discussions because what did you do for your child to get cancer in the first place? And there was still a lot of emotional distress to talk about needing cancer survivorship care even if it was 10 or 15 years out. Um, so we had this opportunity through the NCI and the Center to Reduce Cancer Health Disparities. One was to uh, establish infrastructure within the community setting to do the research. Well, what is the IRB and, and all of this? Um, we had to develop that equal partnership between a cancer center and a community organization, and our goal was to develop a culturally relevant educational intervention that could be delivered in the community setting that hopefully will increase rates to intent to seek care and know about your risk-related effects. So this was just our structure for the research design. Um, we knew what were the key messages that needed to be included in our intervention. We used community advisory groups to say what was the best way to relay this information. We had an internal advisory committee using different methods, including the Delphi panel, both from internal advisory committee members, scientific members from our UCLA scientific community and the Padres community, and now we have our photo novella. And so currently we're um, testing it for the effectiveness. Um, uh, this is um, Esperanza, which was something that was used in the Padres educational materials. Um, and uh, so we've had, she's age 10 and she can't get, get any older. So we have created new characters who are teens and young adults to talk about their cancer experience. And our goal is to um, improve discussions. We're using motivational interviewing uh, to decrease cancer stigma, that it's okay to talk about cancer, it won't come back, improve their knowledge about risk for late effects. And hopefully this will, um, translate into their intent to seek survivorship care, and uh, we should have those results hopefully by the end of summer. So I thank you, and I welcome any questions. Okay, so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Bridget and the organizers for inviting me to speak and for organizing this great symposium. Um, I think it's really nice to, to have sort of the link between people like me, which is sort of a basic researcher, um, to interface with clinicians, and so this is, I think, a great first symposium, and I look forward to many more. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you about today is some of our um, work thinking about um, how to use human pluripotent stem cells for um, regenerative and preclinical approaches to uh, change muscular dystrophy, or DMD. So what is DMD? Well, DMD is a devastating disease. Um, it affects uh, 1 in 3,500 male births. Um, it's an X-linked recessive disorder. Uh, it's a really um, you know, devastating progressive um, muscle disease. And, and there's wheelchair dependency that really occurs between days uh, age uh, 9 and 11. So, so there's a sharp transition um, to loss of, of muscle strength and function. Um, and life expectancy is really um, in the uh, late teens or early 20s. So, so what is the cause of this? Well, the um, genetic um, modifier of this disease or the actual cause of the disease is dystrophin. And so this is really due to lack of dystrophin. And dystrophin is this um, protein here that's actually the largest gene in the genome, 79 exons, 
that plays this um, you know, stabilizing role between the actin um, network here and the basal lamina cytoskeleton. And so without this um, protein dystrophin, you actually have a loss of this complex um, called the DGC. And without the DGC, this causes sort of tears in the muscle membrane, the sarcolemma, which leads to uh, leakiness in the membrane, uh, lack of um, you know, stability, excess calcium comes in, um, creatine kinase exits, and so this really just disrupts the um, cell, which eventually leads to um, uh, cell death over time. Um, and so there really are no treatments. Um, the current thoughts are really just monitoring progression. Uh, monitoring uh, heart function, respiratory function. Uh, there's some stretching exercises, physical therapy, takes on some surgery, um, although this is tricky with these patients. And as I said, most are, are wheelchair bound, eventually end on ventilators. Uh, the real only progressive treatments that are currently used in the clinic are steroid treatments, um, which have been shown to, to have um, an extension of the lifespan of these patients. Um, but that's really um, the only certain standard treatments. However, the great news is that there are a lot of therapeutics um, in the pipeline that people are thinking about. Um, and so, so I don't have time to go into all of these, I apologize, but there are um, some that are sort of the furthest along in, in clinical trials are really these, um, uh, these drugs that really target exon skipping. And these are ways that are thinking about how to restore dystrophin, uh, functional protein um, back into the, the muscle cells. Um, there's another um, drug that's, that may be close to getting approved in Europe that's important for um, codon read through. Other ways are not really to, to restore dystrophin, but to think about um, targeting some of the other effects such as fibrosis, upregulating uh, other compensatory proteins that are involved in this DGC network I told you about, decreasing myostatin, which is known to increase muscle mass. So there's some controversy on the pros and cons of using that. Um, inflammation, targeting decreasing inflammation um, is, is an important component. And I think that um, one of the things that we're thinking about in the field is really not just one, but multiple ways to treat this disease. So it may involve both targeting inflammation, decreasing fibrosis, increasing the ability to make functional protein and sort of stabilizing all of these different avenues. Um, my love for the longest time has really been interested in stem cell biology. And so we're thinking about stem cell approaches to this disease. Um, and so this is what I'm really gonna focus on today. Um, so I, I just wanted to briefly mention some other things that are happening here at UCLA, and this is at the Center for Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy, or CDMD. And so there's a number of investigators here really thinking about approaches to treatment of this devastating disease. And so this is showing you the DGC, the dystrophin glycoprotein complex. Here's dystrophin stabilizing the actin and the cytoskeleton network. And there are many different ways to think about targeting this disease, and many investigators here are, including utilizing drugs that promote enhancers of exon skipping to restore um, dystrophin expression, upregulating other compensatory protein complexes. Um, but what I'm gonna tell you about is our work briefly um, on how to think about um, utilizing human pluripotent stem cells to make a regenerative cell that can be a replacement cell in this disease. So why would we wanna do this? Well, when dystrophin's missing and the muscle cell membrane is leaky, these cells eventually die over time. And so what happens is the satellite cells, which are the endogenous stem cells, get activated. And these get cues to say, hey, now it's my turn, get in, repair the damage. Well, over time, those stem cells are exhausted and can no longer um, repair the disease. So our approach has been thinking about how to make pluripotent stem cells um, in, in context of making muscle stem cells to repair and re regenerate um, this disease. And so um, we've had talks about this earlier, so I won't go into details, but just to say that we've been thinking about how to make induced pluripotent stem cells from patient cells, differentiate these back into pluripotent stem cells as a way to screen um, in a preclinical setting um, drugs that might be useful in, in this context. So we're developing these um, patient-specific iPSCs. We're learning how to differentiate them into skeletal muscle. We are developing preclinical screening tools with the hope of eventually having a nice population of muscle cells that we can combine with a correction strategy to give back to the patients. Um, so, so far what we've done is we've been able to generate um, iPSCs from a number of different um, patient mutations 
These are important because these go hand in hand with some of our collaborators interested in, in combining exon skipping therapies. Um, so we made these lines for reasons with patient specific mutations um, to test these technologies. Um, all the lines we made so far are pluripotent. I don't have time to show you all the data, um, but we have now a number of unique uh, pluripotent stem cell lines from DMD patients that we can test these therapies on. And just preliminarily show you some, um, some progress we've made in this uh, setting. We've actually been able to uh, make fused myotubes from our DMD IPSC lines. Um, in this case, this line had a mutation um, that would allow us to skip over um, a region which is called exon uh, 51 using uh, this approach to restore the, the, the reading frame and give us a truncated but partially functional protein. So in testing this in our preclinical model of these DMD lines, we're able to show that different concentrations of antisense oligonucleotide can skip over um, this region and render us a functional um, skipped product. And so we're optimizing this now in combination therapies with some uh, preclinical um, exciting drugs with our, with our collaborators here at UCLA. So I just want to take the last few minutes to tell you about something that our lab is really interested in, which is to develop a progenitor cell um, from these pluripotent stem cells that, as I was saying, can be used to repair or generate uh, damaged muscles. And so this is quite challenging uh, to be able to understand the cues to really get to these progenitor cells. What we're looking for is a progenitor cell that expresses these transcription factors, PAX3 and PAX7, um, as well as other extracellular markers such as MCAT here. And these cells will then go on to fuse to make terminally differentiated fused myotubes and functional myofibers. And so how to get there from pluripotent stem cells is quite challenging. Um, what we're thinking about is following developmental cues, such as activation of BMP4s, um, plus or minus FGFs, non-canonical or canonical WINT activation. And in doing this, what we've been able to see is that we can get expression of some of these early transcription factor markers, um, staining in, um, it, although it's heterogeneous, in uh, portions of these um, differentiated uh, colonies and clusters. And this is in contrast to the standard protocols, which are just spontaneous embryo body um, or early just two-day BMP4 treatment. So in these directed differentiation cultures, we can get an increase in expression of MCAT here, and which, as I told you, is a marker of these early progenitor cells. So we're excited, and one of the first things that we did was to test to see how well these actually can engraft in vivo. So here what we did was we took an immunocompromised mouse model. We pre-cheated these uh, mice with cardiotoxin to damage the limb muscle. Then we took our progenitor cells um, from the previous slide I was showing you the directed differentiation and showed that these cells actually can have engraftment potential. So here we're looking at just a, at a simple stain of a human marker in a cross section of the leg muscle. And we can see that we do have pockets of our cells engrafting um, from this directed differentiation approach. So um, now what we're trying to do is really optimize um, this platform. And so this really becomes the challenge is thinking about um, what are the signaling cues that are active during development? So what are those signals that pattern the somite that tell these cells to specify to become a true progenitor? And that's really what um, we're focusing on now. And actually, my postdoc has a poster um, on this. If you want to see more about kind of what we're thinking, um, we'd be happy to talk to you about this. But we're thinking about um, early specifiers of praxal mesoderm, um, later stage mesoderm, somite development, and then later stage uh, skeletal muscle specification. And then the further challenge is once we get these progenitors, not just to get there, but to support those cells. So we're thinking about ways to really enhance the self-renewal of those progenitors. And so we're developing reporter lines to really pull these out, track these, put these in screening formats to look for uh, modifiers of, of um, self-renewal in, in this context. So um, in summary, what we're doing is developing directed differentiation protocols um, to purify progenitor cells. Um, we think this will eventually be useful in, um, in using these um, in therapeutic potentials, as well as developing preclinical screening tools. Um, I didn't have to tell you, I didn't have time to tell you about some unique reprogramming platforms we're doing to try and directly get these um, progenitor cells. Um, and then what, finally, what we're doing is, you know, with our collaborators really building um, models to test some of these preclinical platforms um, with the collaborators in the CDMD here at UCLA. So with that, I'd like to thank um, the support from the Broad Stem Cell Center, Saran in particular, which helped us make these DMD IPSC lines, um, funding to, to carry out some of the directed differentiation, and then members of the CDMD who we've been collaborating with on these studies. So thanks for your time.